Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers, and we are celebrating rural education tonight and learning more about it and talking to each other and reconnecting and all of that. Um, I'm going to just tell a very brief story um, that uh, Linda Christensen and Renee Watson, um, Renee had written a book and has written a book about um, one of the themes in the book is um, uh, gentr gentrification, and it seemed to me that the Portland Writing Project, that they've been playing with the curriculum around that, and we had them on a few weeks ago, and I made an off comment that, you know, this is place-based education, um, but it's in a city, and it's kind of different. I wonder what place-based education looks like, again, in rural areas. And Karen, who um, you can speak for yourself, but it's one of your passions, is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Is rural, um, rural matters in general, said, hey, let's get some people together. And um, so we invited some folks, um, and they're going to introduce themselves. But that's, that's one of the generations of this show, um, this tent here tonight. Karen, do you want to say any more by way of introduction? You're going to be a little more of a moderator here tonight, since this is one of your passions. <laughs> well, I'll just tell you. you where I am and sort of mm -hmm. what rural is to me. Um, I live on the Arizona-New Mexico border in the f extreme south part, about 45 miles north of the Mexican border. And the nearest sort of town that has a grocery store size is is there. So it's about an hour away. Um, I have, there's two very small towns within about 20 miles of me, just a couple hundred people each. Um, and I do, I, I've lived here um, a little over six years, and I moved here from Los Angeles, so it was a big change made very intentionally to sort of go to the middle of nowhere and find some peace, which I have done and I love. And I also do a lot of rural policy work in different areas, so that's part of how my interest and, and just awareness of what rural means and how many different things rural means and what some of the policy issues are has come out of that work. So I'm excited to see everybody here. Is that is that Terrence? Yes. Good. Yay. Um, Terrence, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is – thank you. My name is Terrence Sanders. I teach at a school called Bramer. Uh, it's in Bramer, Missouri. I teach middle school language arts. And I am excited to be here. Welcome. Thank you. And one of the questions we're asking you to check in on is uh, your sense of the word rural and what that means to you as you're introduced. Is that good, Karen? Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah. So, Terrence, we're asking you to think about that as you introduce yourself. Yeah. All right. Well, um, rural to me is small. It's generally in the country. It's away from the city. Um, so in the basic, that's what I'd say it is. Good enough. Great. Yeah. Um, Lynette? Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thanks. Been a while, but uh, nice to see you. It has been a while, and I'm very happy to be back with my NWP friends, let me tell you. Uh, I'm Lynette Herring-Harris. I live in a small community called Morton, Mississippi. That's where I'm coming from tonight. I'm the former program associate who managed the, net, the Rural Sites Network, Special Focus Network for NWP, and the Teacher Inquiry Community Special Focus Network for NWP. I am currently working for an organization, another educational nonprofit, called City Year, so I'm happy that we're also going to be talking about the difference between rural and urban, because I've really grappled with that in the last three years since leaving um, NWP. When I think of rural, to be quite honest, I think of I think of multi generational families. I think of a place that that um, is intended to be where we grow our roots. I think of the the children who are so pleased to love their place and who love their place enough sometimes that they're actually willing to sacrifice their education and their and their ability to 
grow the way we would like for them to as educators because it means they'll have to leave their place. So when I think of rural, I always go back to people and family and the roots that are not not just the agricultural roots, but those metaphorical roots of multi generation, generation after generation that's lived on the same land in the same place. You said that quickly, but um, one of the things I'm remembering uh, that you turned me on to back when during the Gulf oil spill, we were connecting a lot, um, was this uh, this idea of leaving. You know, I, I teach kids in the South Bronx, and, and there is some notion in the Bronx of success means you leave your community. Um, and there seems to be plenty of differences there, but also some similarities. Um, Oh, I, I agree with you. Um, one of the, I think to leave a place that has been your security and your sense of um, being and to have to move from that and go somewhere else in order to be educated is a really frightening thing for, for people, especially first generation people to graduate high school and try to go to college. And Michael Corbett did some very, really interesting work. Um, the, the name of his book is Learning to Leave. Mm -hmm. And he actually talks about how rural schools, without intending to, have actually supported the out-migration in rural places by encouraging their best and brightest to go away to college. And then when they go away, they can't figure out how to come back to their place and to fit in their place anymore. And so he has some brilliant research around that, um, a mm -hmm. longitudinal study of about 11 years. Um, of what happens with rural students. And we found the same to be true around um, our work with Native American students, that the, tribal, the tribes want their children to be educated, but they also want their children to stay and to be a part of the culture that they're grow they've grown up in. And so there's that constant tension between global and local, and what do we do, and how do we figure out how to support our kids who do leave, and I actually have, have challenged the idea of learners and leavers, and I believe there's a third category that nobody's written about, and those are the returners, and that's what I think our goal, both for rural education and for those kids in the Bronx who say they can't leave, <laughs> how do we get them to be educated and then return? Mm -hmm. Great, wow. Okay, so you've jumped us in there. <laughs> Thank <I'm sorry>. you. <laughs> no, no, don't be sorry. That's great. Mary, introduce yourself. I am, I, hello Lynette, um, and what you've said has brought me pleasure. Um, I work, I, I retired in 2014 as I was an educator at a local rural school where K-12 did not break 200 students. Uh, there are three small towns, um, I live on a farm outside of it, and the picture you see of my um, thing is out my back door. So um, in looking at what Lynette has said, I have gone to work with a um, group in our community that was formed about three years ago. It's called Tri-C Partners for Progress. And we work, we have representatives of business, education, health and wellness and government on our group. And we're working toward what Lynette had referred to of uh, the kids being educated and then coming back to the community to add to the community. And we have seen that turn around in the last five or six years. We have 10 uh, newlywed with some of them with small children, um, former members of the community educated in the school have come back to live in the community. They may drive for two hours to work but they choose to live in this community because of their past. And Mary, when you were teaching, what, what were you teaching? I taught 7 through 12, science, health, home economics, and tech. Wow. That's Very what nice. you do in a small school. You wear lots of hats. I didn't say it, for the, but for the 30 years that I taught, I taught 4th through ninth grade, and I taught everything at some point except Algebra 1 and Physical Science. <laughs> And I taught all 58 of those little scoundrels that were in the in a grade. <laughs> Swinging back to Terrence before we get to the other classroom there, what, what did, you, did you say what you're teaching English, was it? Or? Yes, I teach middle school language arts, and 
at our school we have one section, so I have sixth, seventh, and eighth. And of course, I have all of the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Mm -hmm. um, Very nice. So you would you would loop with them too. You'd be with them for some time. So well, I've saying. had yes, my eighth graders. I've been at Bramer for three years, mm -hmm. and my eighth graders are special, and they know it because they mm -hmm. are the first group that I've had all three years. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came, I had my first round of eighth graders, and they've gone. And then, so my sixth graders, when, my first year are now my eighth graders. And, um, Very nice. yeah, and, and I'd like to add to my definition of rule um, <laughs> because I am a, an import. I taught in Kansas City for about nine years and then taught here in Bramer for three. Um, and so I have a unique uh, perspe perspective as to what rural education is, what urban education is. And I've learned that from my students, actually. Um, I live in Bramer. And I have no plans of ever moving because of the community that's built around me. So um, it's much more, and it's hard to condense in words, um, as I don't want to take up too much time. But I would say that rule is home, for sure. Yeah. Great. So John Wayne is going to introduce himself. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, are, there are three teachers, right, in Brackenridge? And right. thank you for staying late in your classroom there. So, do you want to introduce yourselves? Okay, I'm Linda Gaines, um, and I teach English 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And we're a K-12 school. And I, I, who was it that said you taught everything except... <laughs> yeah, I understand that very well. Um, this is Violet. Robin. My name is Robin Roselle Estenbaum, and this is my second year at Breckenridge, and my second year as a teacher. Um, I'm 49 years old, and I just, um, after all these years, and finally in the teaching profession, and I teach special education uh, K through 12. May, may I ask, uh, are you was there another profession before this one? Or? Well, um, I went to college right out of high school when I graduated in 1983 and um, worked for my father. I've gone to college my whole life, got married, had children, kept going to college, and it took me a little while longer. Got it. Cool. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Welcome. My name is Jody Yule. I am a facts teacher here at Breckenridge. I teach 7 through 12 facts. I also teach K through 6 elementary keyboarding. Um, it's my second year as a teacher. Before this, I spent three years in the hotel industry. The last two years of that, I was the general manager of a comfort and in suite. So, teaching is where I always wanted to be, and here I am. And are all three of you involved with the College Ready Writers Program? Is it program or? Yeah. Project. Project, yeah, okay. Is that right? You're you're all involved with that. And can you briefly say what that is, and then say something about rural for for the, each of you too? Well, the college, um, the writing project. All three of us uh, attended last summer uh, with Tom and Susan um, and Terrence. Okay. It's the Summer Institute, is what it's called, and um, we. Uh, became writers, and I don't recall how many people were in our class, uh, but we got to know each other very well because we attended every day for almost the entire month of uh, July. Um, it was like going to work. It was like 8 to 4, and, and we got to know everyone real well and wrote about a lot of different subjects. Um, I don't know. It, it was... A wonderful experience. Um, I'm from North Kansas City, Missouri. I uh, graduated uh, there. Um, my father owned his own business in the city. Um, I moved to uh, Richmond, Missouri, and then Hardin uh, because of the gentleman I married. Um, we chose to raise our children in a small community, which is Hardin, uh, which is about 40 minutes south of Breckenridge. Um, I worked in the city my whole life for my father, and uh, 
in uh, a pallet industry, and then I uh, went to work for Harden as a secretary for 14 years while my children were young. Mm. And, and, uh, Get my degree when my child got older. My uh, definition of uh, rule is much similar to uh, parents'. Um, Having to do with home. Right. Uh, it's just my definition of rule is somewhere I always wanted to live when I was little because uh, I, wa I wanted the quiet and I, I liked the animals and nature and. Uh, Peace and just a, I think a, a rural community is a wonderful area to raise children in. I, uh, my classmates, a number of uh, 400. Um, I knew every one of them, but not well. I think a rural community is ideal to raise children in, safe, and um, for the most part, and I, don't know, I think it's an ideal place to live. Thank you. I grew up in St. Joseph, Missouri, and so all my experience teaching, student teaching within larger schools, this was my first job coming out to this little town, and that was 35 years ago, and I'm still here. I have raised two children here in this town, and I wouldn't go back to the big city at all, even if some people would think I would. I should, I'm not going. I like to be small and small town and the community feeling, the family feel. And I think that's what we have here in our school, in our community. We know everybody. And I'm on second generation. I'm the third. Say, say your first name. Is it Luis or your first name? I'm Linda. 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 I'm sorry. You cut out a little bit when you first said that. OK. Linda, well, thank you. In rural to me, I grew up in Bremer, Missouri, which is actually where Terrence works. And um, so I was born and raised there, graduated from there, went to Springfield, Missouri for college, and then moved back to Bremer after graduation and worked in Chillicothe, Missouri, which is the next big town to Breckenridge or Bremer. Um, but rural to me is similar to what they explain it as, comfort, family, home. Everyone knows everyone. Everyone's there for you. It's just where you feel comfortable. Um, same with the kids, they feel comfortable here. If they went to a big school, they wouldn't feel comfortable. So this is their comfort zone. Great. So Sherry Edwards, welcome. You're an old friend of the show, and you're here <laughs> often, but some, not before the camera often. But so nice to see you. I want to introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Sherry Edwards, and I teach language arts, like Terrence does, to fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades in Nespelum, Washington. It's a rural public school on the Colville Indian Reservation. And I've been here for 30 years. So and my definition of rural is small, away from the big city, and definitely home. And sometimes it's hard to recruit people to these small towns because they don't understand that feeling. <laughs> Of closeness and knowing everybody. Thank you. Welcome. So, last introductions. These have taken some time, but that's fine. I'm good with that. Uh, Susan and Tom, welcome. Hi, I'm Tom Pankowitz. Uh, I'm, I'm a retired high school English teacher. I've taught there for 30 years and 14 years at a local college, and for a number of those years, I've been associated with the Prairielands Writing Project, and for three years ago, we received a, a, a grant, a uh, Department of Education Investing in Innovation grant that had additional funding from the Rural School and Community Trust and the, and the Gates Foundation to work with a series of small rural schools in our area who were designated as high needs. And for the last several years, we've been working with the teachers at Breckenridge and Raymond and another school nearby called Hamilton, Missouri School, and to, to work on, in, in a sense, teaching, reading, and writing arguments, argumentative writing. And the, it's been a wonderful experience. When three years ago this spring, when we drove out to the schools for the first time, I literally thought rural was 
a school that was on country roads with large cornfields and soybean fields around them, and uh, and that's the only difference. That was the difference. And I was in the school for about 15 minutes, and I said, "This isn't the the school that I thought it was." It was uh, there. There was a as you all are saying home and family. It's a a connection. I taught in a school that prided itself in the city, a, a school of about 1,200 that said, well, we're different because we're a neighborhood. And I understood neighborhood. Uh, rural is different. And it's, it's different in a, in, in a, in a, a much more, in a, in a deeper way. It's different, in, as, as you've said, about community and family. Not just the kids knowing each other, but the kids liking each other and wanting to work together. And that came across very clearly. And it not only is with the students, but it's also with the faculty. And the, the, the three schools that we're working with, these faculties are closer than any faculty uh, I, I can, well, I've had, I've had the experience of working with. I think rural is, is that, that sense of community draws people together. Susan? Oh, that was great. Um, Hey everybody, I'm Susan Martins and I'm the director of the Prairie Lands Writing Project here. This is only my second year. Tom was one of the founding uh, founders of our site and I'm just so happy that we have four brand new teacher consultants from the Prairie Lands Writing Project here on this amazing radio show. So Terrence and Robin and Linda and Jody all became teacher consultants this summer. Uh, but they started working with us through the College Ready Writers program like Tom talked about. And um, I was a high school English teacher in a rural uh, school in Nebraska for 12 years. And so my heart is always going to be in that rural school setting. And I'm thrilled to be here working with rural teachers. To me, rural is, yeah, I don't really like football and I'm so sorry, but Friday Night Lights, <laughs> <laughs> um, sitting on the river, watching the current go by, it's sitting in your backyard and watching the fireflies come on like light from the night. That's rural to me. And a nice river here in New York, too. You know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing she forgot was country music. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> So, uh, so uh, jump in a little bit. Um, you've heard these introductions. Um, I don't know, maybe what you thought you'd hear, or maybe not. But what are some of the issues you face as um, rural educators? That's it's purposely very vague. That question to let you come up with what you think is important here. I'll jump in, Paul. This is Lynette. Um, I think that there are quite a few issues. Some of them do deal with geography, but I think there are larger issues that impact rural places. One of those issues, I think, is the bias toward rural people. That there's this idea that rural people are hillbillies and country bumpkins, and that um, that how in the world can they possibly run a good school? And there's this idea that there has to be somebody from the outside, from an urban place that comes in to reform that small rural school. And what we know is that often rural schools are small laboratories where actually if urban schools could figure out how to really look at what happens in the rural setting, they could actually learn a lot about how to reform their schools. I think that's one one of the things, one of the issues. I think the geography is an issue because we do have kids who do have to when we think about education, we have to think about busing. We have to think about how long it takes a kid to get home. And the types of chores a child has to do after school that are unique to their place. And what that means when we think about homework, what, how much we want them to read in the afternoons. I think these are issues that, that urban schools don't often have to, or don't think about as much. And um, for me, um, one of the biggest issues that I think that that rural schools have to deal with right now is what I call the death sentence policies, where politicians believe that the best thing to do with a rural school that has a small number of students is to consolidate it. And when that consolidation happens, the community dies. 
And so think you, it's hard to think about rural education and not talk about the community as well because the school is sort of like the crown jewel of the community. And when something happens to it, it happens to the entire community. So I think these are those are just a couple of issues that always come to mind for me. And the idea that someone said earlier something about retention of teachers. And I think about like um, in this in my little town where I live right now, the uh, county superintendent of education is also a principal, and he also drives a bus. So he drives a bus, is a principal, is the superintendent. He is the superintendent of a county school that has five different little school pods in it. And he does everything that an urban superintendent does in terms of reporting, grant writing, all of that, plus driving the bus, plus being the principal, plus being the superintendent. So our leadership is uh, is very difficult to get the right people in a rural place, and so we have to figure out how to grow our teachers. How do we find the people, the right people in the community, to grow out our our new educational leaders? If I could just say something, sometimes rural, I notice rural schools are just a, a stopping point sometimes for teachers in their uh, career path. They get their education here for one year and then they automatically they pass on to another school. Um, I think uh, Ms. Shulman and I and a couple of other teachers that started with us, uh, we, we feel devoted to this school and the children. and. Um, uh, to me, this school is a blessing, and I, I don't know how anyone would ever want to leave it. Um, something that uh, enters my mind is uh, regarding what's unique about a rural school is that from the sports standpoint is you need all of your children involved in every sport to keep your schools going and active. And active. Um, we need all of our students involved in basketball so we can have a basketball team. Um, uh, and our students are not only just involved in basketball, but they have to be in everything. They're the band, they're the choir, they're everything. And sometimes that's that's an issue because we all share the same kids. So if she wants them for something, and I need them for something. We <laughs> figure out how to how to make it. And it, when we do, somehow we make it work. But like um she. Lynette had, might have said, um, <laughs> um, our secretary, Lori, she drives the bus every morning and then she comes to school. Um, our superintendent also ride, drives the bus. Our ag teacher, he drives the bus. Um, they're here at Breckenridge and many rural schools, as in yours, you don't just have one job. You have, you have many jobs. We clean, sometimes clean our halls. We sweep our, we sweep our rooms. We dump our own trash. We Shovel the snow. Um, <laughs> wherever we're needed, coach we, we need help. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Shula and I uh, coached elementary basketball this season, and um, it's all learning. One other one other point about uh, rural rural schools, or that you mentioned, it, and that the funding. Tom, Tom, lean in a little bit. The funding is also a problem. Uh, not not that the, the schools are poor, not that the communities don't support them with money, but there, there never seems to be enough. And one way, one area that we've noticed where it especially is, is, a, is a problem, besides teacher salaries, the, the obvious one, but is, is in technology. The schools might have computers, but they don't have the, the capacity for every student to be on the computer. They have wonderful libraries, but they don't have computer stations necessarily, or the the means to for for students to to do research within the within it. So there's an issue of, of funding that's also a, a concern with rural that, that I think with rural uh, education. Is that is that internet connection or what is the why isn't why aren't the computers available for every student? Would it be the I'm jump in here, Paul. Yeah, go ahead. Mary, I'm going to jump in here. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with tech ed for quite some time in our rural school, and one of the things that rural schools faced then was we could get computers on grants, but to get the training, the uh, education for teachers to make use of that equipment was a problem. Um, we 
we use Prairie Lands uh, a lot for that. I taught several uh, summer workshops um, at Prairie Lands for that very use with writing with technology. We have a, we had a place-based writing with technology, Karen, and I think it's still on the Prairie Lands website that anybody could log <laughs> on to it and probably use it. Um, we had a very good attendance there. Another thing that schools are facing now that I know about is that their bandwidth is yeah. not big enough to have the whole class on or several classes on all at the same time. So yeah. bandwidth is a big problem right now, I see. And that goes back to like the, the thing of you can't separate the school from the community. When the community doesn't have the right infrastructure, the school can't the school can't magically have an infrastructure that the community doesn't have. And we do know that there are a lot of particularly small rural places where they fall between towers and you just don't have you just don't have the access to the broadband support that you need to be um, to be able to take advantage of the internet. So are there are there programs uh, you know solutions to some of this in, in the works or the broadband issue I know that that's been something that's been in the works for trying to figure out for quite some time and there are some grants where you can actually work with your town to get the to get the the um, infrastructure but often the towns nor the school have the human capacity to get that done because it has to be a joint a joint process between the school, the community, and the state. So trying to get all of those moving parts together is sometimes more difficult in a rural setting than it might be in a city where you have a, a really robust chamber of commerce and a really robust um, group of business leaders who are going to help you with those types of things. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I, I just... Uh... It reminds me of talking to a tech guy one time, and he visited our school, and he said, you know, you, you could have repeaters in each of the rooms. You could have this. You could have that. You know, there are ways to speed up what the connections you guys have here in your building. Um, but we don't have him to come in and do that. So, yeah, I, I kind of <laughs> see how, like, the human expertise has to go along with the, the technology. I mean, is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, yeah. There has to be someone who can actually do the work uh, mm -hmm. to make it happen. And in this, it, like for instance, there has to be someone who writes the grant. There has to be someone who manages the grant. There has to be a local official who will also help to take responsibility for those things. And in small rural places, um, that just becomes a struggle sometimes. It isn't impossible, but it's just harder to make it happen. Any other issues that have come up already that you, anybody wants to jump on here? Our daughter was telling us that um, Mary. we're having trouble finding teachers in the rural areas, um, qualified teachers. And we do live just, it's just 16 miles from Northwest Missouri State University, and they're still having problems because people are saying, I don't want to teach. And I don't. I'm not sure why. Yeah, Mary, are you saying uh, you think people don't want to teach because we're seeing a decrease in uh, enrollment in teacher preparation programs, or people don't want to teach in rural places? Susan, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, I just know that our daughter teaches. <clears throat> that we have three daughters. They all three teach. Uh, I taught. So it's teacher talk at any of our family gatherings and I know they are searching for a couple of teachers right now and they can't find them and I like I said I don't know why I think teacher preparation is okay is pretty good but you know it's just not the fit I guess I think sometimes in rural communities people don't want to drive the distance it takes me 40 minutes to get to work you have another teacher who drives an hour and a half to get to work and, and sometimes because of the low salary schedules, it, it does, it is um, difficult on your pocketbook because there, it does, it's a lot of gas. But um, 
maybe sometimes sometimes that's the reason that rural teachers are more difficult to find is because of the distance they have to drive and the pay. So what 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 about place-based education? That's one of my questions, but if you have others, like what is place-based education in a rural area and as you were talking about the community and the infrastructure and so forth, I, I was wondering, you know, there's a lot of talk about lowering the walls between the classroom and the community. Uh, what does that look like in rural areas? I, I think place-based education, place-based, particularly place-based writing, there is mm -hmm. a huge amount of opportunities in a rural community for students to write about a variety of topics uh, for them to explore their communities and maybe learn about more about their communities than they ever thought mm. was there. It makes them more observant. It lets them pursue their interest. Um, I, I had a great time doing place-based writing when we did it at Prairie Lands. So. Mm -hmm. Can you really define what that means exactly? I was going to, I was going to say that um, in, at Breckenridge earlier this year, we did a writing marathon. Uh, they, I think they took the school out into the community and beyond, and the kids wrote and shared their writing. It was, you know, just taking taking that that time. I know Terrence took, I think, his seventh graders for the last two years to college campuses for visits because he found out that many of the students didn't have much of a of an idea of what college is like. So, you know, in, in, in both cases, if you'd like some, I guess, some real examples of, of place-based writing, you know, Linda at Breckenridge and Terrence at, at Bramer could give you some examples that they've been used, that they've used in the, in the last year. Yeah. One of the things that, as Tom mentioned, we've done is a writing marathon, and we're actually planning one for May the 4th for 8th um, and 10th graders. Um, but in our writing marathon, the students basically go somewhere in the community. We went around Bramer, and they wrote. They wrote various genres, various lengths, and then we shared. Um, talking about the rural community, it increased the community amongst writers. Now, I have to be honest, because... I am taking in a lot of information. I've never, I've, I've never come to grips with the difference between urban and rural. Um, it seemed like because I have taught in urban communities, and in urban communities, um, it seems like they try to denote a difference between the students and rural communities. And right now, it's the same. I see the students. Um, as they have different backgrounds, but my teaching style I thought would have to change when I moved to a rural community, but it has not. I teach the same way to the students. Um, so it's interesting, and I'm trying to process. Like That's why I'm so quiet, because I'm processing information right now, um, trying to find understanding and really asking myself the question, have I noticed differences among the two um, uh, urban and rural? And so, forgive me for my silence, but I'm, I'm actually, I'm processing right now. <laughs> Tara, yeah. I think that's so interesting. And Paul, earlier when you said that Linda Christensen was with you and that and you thought, this is, this is project, I mean, this is place-based learning. I can remember when, um, when, when Rural Sites Network was sort of at its peak, a large part of what we did was to try to promote um, place-based based learning and place-based writing and it took us a while to move from what I call the bucolic lovely beautiful pasture grandpa grandma great memory writing which is a wonderful place to start I think we all have to start there but I think when we move to that edgier part like Christensen urges us to do and begin to say how do we write significantly about place how do we take how do we 
take critique our place? How do we take our place mm -hmm. apart? And how do we seek out solutions to issues that are in our place and research and write about them? And I think there's so much power to that when we can have our students do that. And I think about students who actually wrote enough editorials in, in our small town to actually get a recycling program started in our community. And it was nothing but their writing and their persistence and their research and their and their passion for this that caused, you know, when they realized there was no place to recycle unless you drove your garbage for 52 miles, then they decided we needed it locally. And they addressed that issue and they wrote and studied and were, really did a good job. And now that small community can recycle everything but glass. So it's pretty amazing what these students did. And But I have to admit that when I think about place-based, I also think about this is a long time ago when I taught fourth graders, and I remember a lesson that began, you know, where the where the place actually gives us the lessons by accident. We were actually going to the cafeteria, and there was a dead snake in the um, in the grass on the way to the cafeteria. So it became the lesson for the day. We took the snake. We um, I had the students do some research into what kind of snake it was. What it you know was it poisonous or not. What was its range? What was its habitat? What could we expect of it? We coiled him up and we measured his diameter. We stretched him out and we measured his length. He had this funny little bulge, and we so we, based on our research, we hypothesized what that bulge might be. And sure enough, when we cut it open, it was a field mouse. <laughs> um, so the place actually gives you the lesson sometimes if we're wise enough to actually see it. And so to me, it's that critical place-based consciousness, that awareness of place as, as just gifting us with a gift of a lesson when we don't expect it, that is important for us to think about, plus that part of family, memory, um, just the beauty of a place that we want to be able to think about as we think about place-based. So it's when the place gives you the lesson you really need to teach. That, to me, is what place-based education and place-based writing is about. Anybody remember the slogan, Teachable Moment? Right. That was one. <laughs> Outside my classroom window is a field full of cows. Uh, they move every morning when I drive in and move when I leave. Um, the other day I happened to be looking out the window and I saw 11 white-tailed deer running across the field uh, while the cows continued to graze. It was the most beautiful sight. And on the hill right next to it, out my window, uh, there's a large cemetery with beautiful monuments, and um, we can look out our window here, and, and as she just spoke, we can, uh, your topics just range just by looking out the window. It's, it's beautiful, and you wouldn't have that in the city. Uh, and it's so peaceful. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, I mean, I'm hearing... Um the ability to have some spontaneity and go with the flow and go with the direction the students want to go in. Um, but I know, Sherry, you've talked about feeling pressured sometimes to like stay to the curriculum and so forth. So I'm, j I'm wondering how that's different in the world, um, or, or maybe not. The issue of like outside pressures on rural s schools. Well, somebody mentioned earlier about um, schools of with uh, students in need. Well, that would definitely be our school. We're a priority school in our state, which means that the state actually sent us a coach to help us um, improve those scores. So the Common Core and teacher evaluation and putting those objectives out there and working towards that, that's definitely at the top of what we're supposed to be doing. That's, we have immense pressure to do that, which to me is at, um, which is a loss for our students because then we're not doing the things that w will interest them and being out in the community because we're focused on improving those scores. So we find ways to work around that. So. <laughs> Right, we have, um, I was just putting in the chat there that my students blog at Kid Blogs and one of, uh, a colleague from a, a MOOC, um, Bart Miller, added our blog to his and he's in Japan 
And so our kids are now blogging. My fifth graders are blogging with them and having those great friends. So, you know, and that's writing. And I've watched their writing improve. And to be able to show that to these to people that you can't just teach to those sp specific things that are going to be on the test. You have to let things sometimes be natural and develop because they are improving through those blogging because they want those kids to understand. And I, we're, we're, we're missing some of that. So anyway. No, thank you for that. Yeah. Anybody from Missouri? Any thoughts on that question? Or I mean, if it's not a question for you guys, that's great. <laughs> I think there's always pressure right now with the Common Core and meeting expectations, improving the skills. But our youngest daughter teaches language arts, high school, mostly seniors. And she told me mm -hmm. once, she said, Mom, I can teach iamic pentameter with a... Um, all the things you used to do, hula hoops. Mm -hmm. And she actually has hula hoops hanging in her room, and she uses them to teach iamic pentameter. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think if we really work at it as teachers, we should be able to use some of those things that come within our reach and being a te teachable moment to meet some of those standards. Mm -hmm. um, we just have to work at it a little harder. Um, to, to do that, but I think it's possible. It is possible. That's I work with projects and focus statements, and then the kids ask their own questions, and then we have the objectives in those projects that meet the Common Core. But it's not that's not the way the people that are coming in want us to do it. So, but that's how we do it. Projects. I feel like I, I, there's some shyness around answering this question. It's fine, <laughs> or, or getting into it. Maybe, maybe there's a way to talk about um, your definition of college-ready writers program um, and argument, and how you've defined that with each other. Um, is there a way to talk more about about how that program's working? You're kind of in the middle of like a six years, is that right, or something like that? We're at the end of the second of three years. Oh, it's three years, okay. It's three years, and we've worked with Breckenridge, Bramer, and Hamilton for the first two years. I think they've taken the final writing sample at each of the schools by now, and uh, next year we'll be working with the three control schools. And to go back to your, your question about, about the testing, I think it's the teachers feel the pressure. The schools feel the pressure of the test. And I think, and it could be perhaps the, the schools we're working with this year that it seems as if the, 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 the administration, the teachers, recognize this, they work to prepare the students, but I don't think they step in, in the way of the teachers teaching. I think they give the teachers the freedom to teach, as Sherry is claiming for herself. Mm -hmm. And I don't think their administrators, the administration, the administrators that I've worked with are, are doing that. So they don't have the pressure that teachers that we meet in the writing project are saying is they're receiving much more pressure from above, much more administrative pressure to teach to the test. And I don't feel that that's being done, at least in the schools we were working with. I would agree. I, um, I don't feel pressure to teach to the test. Um, but by default, the test the things necessary to do well in the test are taught is because pedagogy is pedagogy. So um, I haven't felt the pressure uh, to teach to the test, not at all. Yeah, so maybe there's there's less of a dichotomy than my question implied. 
And, and one, one, of the, one of the areas that we've tried to work with the, with the teachers over the last two years is that teaching argument should not be something that's added to the curriculum as, oh, well, here's, here's something brand new, you've got to do this. It's simply saying, look at the ways that it can bring life back to your classroom, how you can engage in discussion and debate and look at issues and find ways of expressing this, these issues so that an audience will, will read, will, will, will understand what you're, you're writing. You know, it wasn't an accident that they took a, a marathon. There, there, that wasn't necessarily writing arguments on the marathons or 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 writing to to enter a, a you know the scholastic writing awards contest. It was that there's a there's a sense of pleasure that the students have developed in writing. You know, a, a year ago when we, we, we the first before we began, we took a, a writing sample and some students were given, t you know, 10 or 20 minutes to write and they were writing, you know, a third of a page. You know, the last time we picked up writing, it was five and six pages long. You know, the length has increased, the fluency has increased. We hope that the control increases as well. Sometimes that's where you know it's it's still in it's you know it's, it's we're we're still growing, but but so much has been done, and it's been done not because we've said there's going to be a test, and you all need to do well on that test in in April or May. It's because we've been we've been given the chance to write and to read and to discuss and to think. Something we learned. Oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, something we learned from the principal at Brainburn, um, he was also in our writing project this summer, was something called bell work. And we at Breckenridge have incorporated, those of us who did not do it, have incorporated it into almost every junior high and high school class. So we, when the students come into our classrooms immediately, when they sit down, they have a question on the board there to answer and, and to write about. Sometimes it's a paragraph, sometimes two paragraphs, just a couple of sentences. But they are writing in every single class. In my fifth hour study skills class, I have a question on the board every day. They write two paragraphs and then they stand up and present it as um, a report. And um, they can, students I have that were not comfortable about standing up in front of a class, saying who they are and reading. I have autistic children who can do it with a breeze. And that was a totally different last year when I first came. Um, writing here is, is, is the norm. Uh, a lot of writing. And Others had thoughts? Can I get back to something Tom said for just a second? When Tom was talking about, you know, we do these things because not because it's on the test, but because it's just how we want to teach children and what we want to do with them. It reminded me of Penny Kittle's work in Right Beside Them. When she talks about how we start with the child's comfort zone, we start with that place where where we do have those memories, which is a part of place-based writing. And when we think about place-based education, it actually, you could take, if we taught true place-based education, we would hit the standards in Common Core in terms of the argumentative um, work. It's not like we would have to stop and teach argumentative. It's part of place-based. Um, if we, you know, if we wanted to teach memoir, it's part of place-based. So trying to figure out to me when I think about Common Core, and I have to say that I always question any standards that I'm handed. <laughs> you know, I want to know whose standards those are and who made them up and what they're for. <laughs> but there are some elements of the Common Core standards that actually, I think, free us up to do what writing project tells us to do. What we've learned over years and years of, of our own practices and research that we know is just good instruction. And I think it kind of frees us up for that if we can if we can figure out how to look at it that way. And place-based education with writing and reading actually can blend with some of the elements of Common Core. And oddly enough, inside the math, the constructivist math part, 
that sounds crazy to even think of that when we're talking about writing project. But when it talks about how you have to write in response to math problems and you have to prove your um, understanding, that is really something that when we dig into place based education, critical place based education, that's what students have to do. They have to look at their place, they have to understand it, they have to question it, they have to say, I like this and this and this, but when I get to this line, this doesn't work. This doesn't work anymore. So what's the thing I'm going to put in its place to bring about a sensible solution? And that's what they do on the math, which is also a part of what we do in place-based education. And how do we how do we make that clear and transparent for our students that they're going to be so much smarter than that test by the time we get through working with them? Mm -hmm. And that's um, that to me is a little freeing on occasion. The idea of place-based education is new to me. It's actually the first time that I've heard of it, and I've been reading. <laughs> you've been this. doing it, it sounds like. <laughs> I've, I've been, yeah, well, I, I think that's very natural in rural communities. Um, and as Tom mentioned, I try to take my students, my 7th and 8th graders, to college visits because their place, by default, is going to grow. Mm -hmm. Rural communities are st the the boundary lines are being erased because larger communities are bleeding over to rural communities. And so uh, one of the goals, if you look at mission and vision statements, this student will be global, this and global that. And therefore, the place is going to become global. If you look at some of the influences that um, rural has on the city and city has on the rural, their place is starting to expand and um, to change. My students right now are doing um, spoken word poetry. Um, we do a lot of argument, and argument is really in every genre. If you look at uh, fiction, there is a problem, a conflict, an argument that has to be resolved throughout the um, story. And the same with poetry, especially spoken word, because there's a message that you're trying to convey to the audience. Um, I'm an acronym guy, and so for spoken word, I use um, the idea of sword, spoken as word sword, and it's a weapon that we can use. And I stole that from one of my sixth graders, actually. That is not mine. Um, so that's my sixth graders. And um, but we say, how are you going to use spoken word as a weapon? Uh, what message are you going to convey? Um, we pre presented, and some of my students talked about um, the farmer and how don't you know that when we're driving that tractor down. Um, the road that we are feeding America. And so if you blow your horn or flip us off, we're working for you. And it was, a, it was beautiful. Um, and so, so when we really think about, I guess, the idea of a uh, place base, it, it grows and it changes. Um, and yeah, I, I actually enjoy the idea of it. So yeah. yeah, thank you for that. That's amazing. I mean, I think you captured a lot of what you were talking about. In, in the way you just said that, too. Karen, you wanted to ask that this question in a big way. And and I want to get to, we're getting up to the end of the hour here, and, and ask people to ask, like, what are the big questions? We have promised to come back to this issue um, in two weeks. Um, I don't know if any of you will be able to come back, but Karen Volke is going to be joining us, and, and a graduate student who she works with um, around some of these issues, too. But Karen, go ahead, your question. Yeah, so I just had a question that's that's been on my mind and that Terrence's comment really um, started to get into um, it, and that is it's lack of diversity in, in your rural schools and your in your communities an issue because I find that's really when I think about what are the differences between the urban schools um, that I've worked in and the rural ones that's that's one of the first things I think of is just that lack of diversity and, and is that an issue for you and how do you deal with it? Um, I, could I, given the time, <laughs> <laughs> thanks Karen, that's a, <laughs> drop that on us in the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, no, but really, I mean, I think it'd be great if we ended this with opening up, like, what are the big questions now that we haven't talked about, and we've talked about a lot in an hour, but that's a big one. Um, we're going to limit you to one, though, okay? <laughs> So, Lynette, what, what's, a, what's a big question that you'd want to pose for next time? 
one of the big questions in my own practice right now is trying to find out we know that there are certain elements of of um, around teacher retention that are issues in both inner city urban and rural and one of the questions that I really am grappling with is what is the difference between teacher retention in a rural place and teacher retention in an inner city urban and are there things that we can do around that that we can learn from each other from both of those places and the yeah, second you know, question prepar oh, sorry. preparation is in that too right because I was just thinking yeah. That you know, when a yeah. when a teacher is leaving after being in this place for a year, like was mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that's probably about preparation. But yeah. Kind of, yeah, and and for me that that comes to this thing of how do we get? Uh, there was actually a recent research study of the best studies of the best schools in best rural schools in Alabama, and they took the top ten rural schools that were outperforming other schools. I mean schools that have much more funding and much more possibility and when they interviewed them they found that the best teachers there had I believe the article set, uses the term had a visceral understanding of what it meant to live in a rural community so that's another question that I want to talk about what does it mean for a teacher to have a visceral understanding of what it means to live in a rural community and why does that make them appear to be better according to research mm -hmm. I want to get over, uh, Linda, you were holding a sign up, so I want to give you a chance to jump in here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're just taking notes, okay. Well, I'm going to stay there, the three of you. Um, any questions you have? I have a question. Um, Robin. Yeah. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, um, I think sometimes is trying to um, Combine the small rural schools or phase them out or as you said, let the larger communities come in and annex us into them. Um, what are some things that we can do to help small rural schools stay alive and um, help, help us prosper rather than trying to phase us out? Yeah, great. Okay. No, you don't have to. Great. Okay, no. Mary, any thoughts? Um, being retired, I have no. I don't have a lot of time on my hands. I just choose to use it usually to toward education. Um, the to Breckenridge and the question of how do you uh, help schools, rural schools, make a, be a squeaky wheel to your congressman <laughs> in one thing. Um, also, the community has to be alive for the school to be alive, and the school has to be alive for the community be, to be alive. The community mm -hmm. needs to speak for the community toward the school's education. And that's what I found in working with the community's Tri-C Partners for Progress, um, is that we can do a lot to PR our school, uh, to let people know what is going on? That's why I have a couple blogs and a couple Facebooks. So um, I so, think it's important for the community to be involved with the school and the school be involved with the community. Mm -hmm. Question? Uh, not, not anything pushing right now. Okay. Great. Join us um, if you can again. Um, Sherry, what's on your mind? Um. What's on my mind are, um, you know, we all come from, like you say, our home and what we grew up with, and our students have that same perspective, their own, not our perspective, but their perspective. And um, because when I listen to all you talk, it's your rural experience is somewhat different than my rural experience because we're like an urban, we have urban issues in our rural reservation area. So there's some of that, but I want to know how to expand globally with my students, which we're doing, but how do you deal with that difference in perspective that each of those kids are bringing? Because they don't know the others background and we come with this tunnel that's just that's the thing I'm thinking about because when my kids say something 
on their blogs to their friends in Japan, then those kids have to say, what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> anyway, I think that's interesting, that. Mm -hmm. Tom and Susan? Uh, my, my question would be one which I think we've touched a little bit on today, and that is, how do you deal in, in how do teachers deal with uh, isolation, even loneliness, knowing they might be the only teacher of that subject in dozens of miles? And just the idea of teacher autonomy within a, within a small school or small community. I think those are two questions I'd like to look at. By autonomy, you mean? That how does a teacher work within the system of a, of a rural school where sometimes, yeah, just there are other how, how can the yeah. teacher make more of a more of a of a, of a of a difference within the school and the way the school is run, is in a small rural school. That's a great question, and I I love the diversity question, and I want to talk more about that too. But I also think uh, rural communities have a lot to teach urban communities about diversity. You know, because there's so much diversity within those rural communities that we that the, that is invisible and it becomes glossed over in that pastoral bucolic you know, land that we love. But really, I mean, when I taught, I learned all kinds of things about truck pulling and barrel racing and you name it, but also just about sort of the way diversity looks when your population is so small. So I think the way a community learns about diversity when there aren't very many of you has a lot to teach all kinds of uh, communities about that. So I really want to, I definitely will come back in two weeks to hear people talk about that question. Yeah. Very cool. And you know, as an urban teacher, we, we, we have our diversity issues too in our segregated schools, right? But um, absolutely. Terrence, I don't know if you had a chance to add your question, but then we should wrap up. All right. So um, I'm thinking uh, the idea of place-based education and argument. Uh, one of the issues that school or students in rural communities and urban is the idea of self-esteem. Um, and I would challenge that self-esteem is a liar because it's a comparison. One day you may feel good, another day you may not. And um, I was talking to a student today about she was struggling about her peer relationships and I asked her how does she know that she's certain things and people tell her. Um, I'm wondering how can place-based education um, and teaching argument teach students to internalize who they really are according to where they are. Does that make sense? Um, a student is at a certain place for a reason and uh, teaching an optimistic attitude can help them appreciate that place, use the situations and become something more. Uh, and that's what we really hope for, you know, in our students. So um, my question isn't complete. I'm still, again, I, I'm trying to process so much right now. Um, but I hope to be a part in two weeks. And, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. All right. We'll see you all again. Um, we are here again next week, um, but uh, we'll continue this conversation in two weeks. We do this every week here at EdTechTalk. Um, Dot com, which is a channel of the World Bridges Network that Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo created. Um, so thank you all for this uh, very thoughtful conversation. Talk to you again soon. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you.